All right, welcome to our final day. Um, I'm very excited about this session. Um, it's a new one um, for us, um, but I think it's really important because it's all about um, kind of distilling what you've learned um, and thinking about how you're going to bring it back to your newsrooms. Um, so to that end, I'm happy to introduce Su Lin Tan. She is a, a correspondent for the South China Morning Post. She also, um, you know, among her many accolades, was a 22, 2022 NPF fellow. So she was sitting where you are um, exactly a year ago today. Um, she, unlike our other speakers who went from journalism into uh, economics. Um, she used to work in, in, in investment banking and then became a journalist. Um, so she's got a really interesting perspective um, and is going to talk a little bit about how to do trade stories in a way to differentiate yourself um, from, from the pack. Um, I'd also like to introduce Wayu Jatmika. Um, he is the CEO of Tempo Digital in Indonesia. Um, he was previously the editor-in-chief of Tempo Weekly News Magazine. Um, he specializes in data-driven investigative reporting. Um, he's also done a lot with fact-checking, crowdsourcing. Um, uh, he led the Panama Papers um, from the Indonesia side um, and was also a 2014 Neiman Fellow. Um, at Harvard, Same. yeah, <laughs> I was just a few years later. So, um, so I'm very pleased to have both of them. While you will be speaking a bit more about kind of going in depth, more investigative work, um, using data like like what we saw yesterday, um, and so please uh, join me in welcoming them both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll go first. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here, and sorry for being uh, a bit late this morning. I hope I give you enough uh, time to discuss your homework, I guess. Uh, so this session is designed to be a sharing session, so both of us will share some of our experience. Not like that we you know, know better than you, not, in, not at all, but just to you know, give you some insight, some, uh, you know, um, lesson learned from my mistakes, from my, you know, missteps in the past that probably, you know, knowing that you can avoid it and maybe, you know, become a better journalist than, uh, you know, the, our peers. So, uh, briefly, this is uh, the general principles that I've learned during the years in doing uh, investigative stories, uh, especially on the topic of business and trade. Uh, as you know, it's a bit different than investigating uh, governments or uh, you know uh, other public uh, authorities. Investigating business and trades uh, needs, in my experience, needs more uh, consideration of these three principles because first it needs to be uh, emphasized that it has a public interest angle. Uh, not all, there is of course uh, ways to, to, to find that particular angle, but for private companies, you need to also avoid uh, accusation that you might doing it for you know, commercial interest or for competition uh, interest. So you need to be able to convey this to your readers, making sure that your readers understand there is a public interest and you can you know, show them with stories, with examples of how that uh, angles place in your story. First, I also learned that it's, it is very important to use data, public, uh, publicly available data. Uh, in some instances, it's, it's, it's difficult to get, especially in, our, in, in Indonesia or in Asian countries in general. So it's also important uh, to uh, combine that with field reporting, with observation, with interviews with experts and so on. So it's basically, you know, general principles in everything that we do just just needs to i just need to underline this especially for uh, business stories and i'll give you several examples of that and then of course the last one is making sure that it's always you know layer by layer verified and confirmed to the people or the, the, to the companies accused uh, let me dive into three examples or maybe two examples this is the the story that we did in i think 2020, yeah, October 2020. It's an ongoing story at the time. We were the first publication that uh, broke the story. 
is about uh, an investment, 400 million USD, made by Telkom, the biggest uh, telco uh, company in Indonesia, state-owned, uh, into Gojek. It was 2020. Uh, for some of you who are familiar with the region, uh, temp, uh, Gojek's founder, uh, Nadim Makarim, is also uh, just inaugurated as the Minister for Education. And Telkom, uh, one of Telkom's uh, shareholders is uh, Boy Tohir. He uh, is the older brother of Indonesian state-owned minister. So there is a lot of questions about the decision by Telkom to inject that large amount of money into a digital company. Maybe it's not a startup. It's already a decacorn at the time for uh, Gojek, I think it worth 10 billion USD in 2020. Uh, and then we did uh, the story. Uh, we basically clarify how the deal was done. Uh, there's a lot of uh, rumors uh, swirling around about uh, that connection between those two ministers. And we uh, also uh, got some insiders that tell us how uh, the idea was first uh, discussed within Telkom a few years ago, a few years before it was uh, finally uh, agreed. And it was even uh, checked by the Attorney General Office for potential conflict of interest. So those was the, the big story, but the accusation that was um, directed to us after the story was published is uh, what, what's, what's the public interest? So we have to, uh, fortunately in the, in the story, we, we, we were able to, uh, to underline that it is uh, a large investment and uh, Telcom is a state-owned company. And with that, uh, uh, status, of course, there needs to be layers of la layers and layers of due diligence, layers and layers of you know uh, investment committee, and some of those some of those were not in some experts' uh, comments at the time not thoroughly uh, uh, done. So that was the story. I just want to emphasize the public interest angle. How in this kind of story, in this kind of uh, you know deeper story, story behind the news. It is e very easy for you to be a target of, you know, uh, uh, attack if you not emphasize enough why or the motive behind the story and how, you know, you can convince your readers that there is a public interest uh, on that one. So the second one is uh, a story that I want to show that it is blog, I guess. Uh, this, the second one is about uh, TPL or Toba Pulp Lestari. Um, okay, so hold it. Okay, this is the, the story. The, it was also about, about 2020 because I uh, moved to the management in, in mid 2021. So a lot of my examples come from the time when I was still the chief editor. Uh, we did a story on April uh, subsidiary in North Sumatra called Toba Proplastari. The this one emphasized the need for data-driven uh, investigation and using publicly available data. It is started with a comparison of export-import data. So we uh, compare the export of pulp, the value of pulp export from that particular uh, company. Uh, from Indonesia and the value of import, value of import recorded uh, by Chinese uh, custom office. So there is a discrepancy, uh, and then we try to find out why uh, the discrepancy uh, occur. The same method was used uh, a few months ago when there was this big story about nickel in Indonesia. If you recall, there is a, a story about how 2.7 trillion Indonesian rupiah worth of nickel was smuggled in 2022 to 2023 using that same methods, comparing uh, export import data. Uh, so this is how we did it. Uh, and I think it's very difficult for April to deny the story. And then it was, uh, you know, snowballing into a big uh, advocacy by several environmental uh, civil society group, civil, uh, civil non-government uh, organization also pick up the story and did their own advocacy based on that particular story. So 
using that data really make, uh, made your story stronger and it's also you know sealed you from that accusation that you know you have commercial or political interest so lastly um, how do you then make your story bulletproof this is another um, things that usually worried journalists when they did uh, when they thinking of doing uh, investigative story um, the the the, the notion that it can get sued, you can get people complaining because you're doing a story that no other publication is doing. So there is a higher degree of risk, of course, but if you do this with, you know, uh, uh, a bulletproof mechanism making sure that every facts, every line of sentence you put in your article is check and double check, I think it's very, uh, quite safe in my experience. Uh, my, Worst uh, uh, experience doing investigative stories is getting a comp getting public complaint and getting dox doxed. You know, you have a, uh, become a victim of doxing on the internet, but that's it. I never get sued or almost thrown to jail, but that was like 10 years ago uh, in Aceh. So not, not a big deal. Uh, so the key are very simple. Use verified data, make sure you get the other side of the story. This is a story that we, that we published last week on uh, the state-owned gas company, uh, PGN, uh, Perusahaan Gas Negara, the state-owned uh, LNG company. And we found that they have uh, three big investment that back in 2017, uh, I think worth almost uh, one trillion in recent rupiah that I think 71 million USD. Uh, they bought some uh, LNG field in uh, Texas and in uh, West Java and East Java, and then now, uh, 15 years later, uh, the, the, the net present value of those gas fields is like 50% less than when they did that, that investment. So we, we exposed that story. They got, uh, of course, uh, complaints, but because we have the, 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 the methods is right, we use uh, publicly available audit data uh, and uh, at least seven days after we publish it, yeah, there is no uh, legal uh, complaint yet. So that's it. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm one of you. I'm a fellow journo. Uh, as Anne said earlier, I came from investment banking and I, I spent, actually, I'm, I'm a lot older than all of you actually. It's my second career. I spent 15, 16 years in funds management, I'm a qualified accountant and investment banking. So my career shifted journalism after the subprime crisis, actually. Uh, I found myself carrying a box of stationery at the, on the curbside uh, because my investment firm collapsed in 2008 and 2009. So um, I, as an, a qualified accountant, I, uh, numbers is my thing. So. Uh, I, I find that it's important to use a lot of those numbers, but try and make that more colourful um, for uh, your readers. Um, so I don't have any slides, but I'm going to go on what um, why you had said before. So um, I'll use this session as a means of facilitating some of this discussion about passion projects and what to do and what not to do. Really, my topic is about what I like to do more of uh, and what I like to do less of. Uh, so I find that, you know, these, these conversations don't happen a lot in newsrooms. You know, you're beholden to, you know, daily clicks and you're required to put out a certain amount of news. Um, and so you don't really have time to think about what you should really do more of in trade and business and economics and, and less of anything else. So um, just, just looking at the landscape in the last 12 months, you know, global trades actually changed again. You know, there was a lot of US China before. And now I looked at your topics and you, I, you know, there's India and there's other sort of players in the, in the game. So there's more, and also Southeast Asia is coming up really fast as well. And suddenly everyone's looking at a different sort of landscape just 12 months on. But one thing remains challenging and that's reporting on trade. Um, it's become more of a, you know, bit of a gravy train. You know, you get on, you get on a break, everybody goes after the same stories. You know, you abandon everything, you follow the same story, you end up clambering over each other, writing the same yarn. So, um, but it's really hard to not do that because newsrooms have CVs and mandates and, you know, it's not like newsroom A does explainers and then newsroom B does follow up. So, 
you know, we all have a regular set of audience we want to keep around. So um, there's just too much, I think, I feel. I mean, I, I could be wrong here about, you know, things like what's a trade war, you know, what the sanctions mean. There's a lot of these explainers that go around. I think they're important, but they, they're, they're things that shouldn't, it really shouldn't take up a lot of our time. And maybe AI could be part of that solution, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so uh, I, I, I have a long list of investigative stories that YU has put up some of the ones that I would have liked to do. Um, and I realized that this list is going to go on forever. I probably will never ever finish it. But um, I'd like to take the op opportunity to discuss some of these passion projects, if I may. And then we can talk about some of your passion projects and you know, what we can do to get that going. Um, so, uh, OK, so first of all, I'd like to do more data journalism, as why you have mentioned. Now, I, I don't know how much time you spend around you know, the WTO, IMF um, data, but there's a lot of data in those areas, like public data that you can actually use on a regular basis. I assume that you've looked at them, and if you haven't, you certainly need to look at these places. And they're quite embedded in there. You have to take time to go and work through them. So that's, that's one thing I like to do more of. Um, I, I've always thought that business, because it's so, sorry to say this, but it's pretty dull and it's very dry. Um, and coming from banking, I know how dull and dry it is and it's probably why I moved to journalism after uh, you know, such a long time in it. But the way to bring it, uh, to, to make these stories alive is to, to turn them into people's stories. So for example, I have a little thing for the mango trade between Cambodia, Vietnam and China. I, I have a thing for it. I like to go down the Mekong and work out, you know, go down the farms and work out all these little, little farms and figure out what sort of trade goes on there, how they sell their mangoes to each other, how their mangoes are taken for granted or they you know, um, I, 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 I spoke to some farmers before, but I, I can't actually go there for budget reasons and time reasons. So it will be nice to go down that river and find out what goes on there, but also the grey trade of mango trading, you know, between these countries. I think there's a lot of, you know, Vietnam taking Cambodia's mangoes and then labeling mango, Cambodian mangoes as Vietnam mangoes. It's sweeter, but nobody knows. And so, you know, there's all that secret stuff that goes on that nobody actually writes about. So I think it's important to bring those stories to life um, because we relate better to people, as you know, uh, with people's stories and color stories than just straight number stories. So that's one of the things I like to do. Um, the other thing I, I, th I thought would be something I like to do, and maybe if you guys got the, have the budget and time, I like to get on the vessel, a bulk carrier, for example, and spend three, I don't know, three weeks on it or where, however long it travels and see how it uh, arrives at port, discharges its goods, and then reloads and goes back again. Um, that whole process, I think, it's quite interesting. Nobody, we don't understand how we get our coal, we get iron ore, we talk about it in a sort of prosaic <coughs> manner, but we don't actually write about how those things happen. So if you want to understand where your shoes came from, for example, they sit in a container. How long does that can container stay on sea for? And how long, you know, it, it, what's the journey of that pair of shoes? For example, follow a pair of shoes that you want to buy, for example, and trace that, that journey of those pair of shoes and how it actually arrives uh, at your doorstep, for example, by e-commerce or at the shops. And now that inflation is such a topic, maybe you can explain why it's actually more expensive than it was you know, uh, two or three years ago. So I like to do more of that and maybe we can talk about your passion projects around that. The other thing that's really, really obscure is the digital trade economy. Now, I don't know what that is, to be very honest with you. I mean, there's this, uh, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, DEPA, that has been signed. Uh, Singapore is a, a signature on it. And, and on that, it says that we all want to be more digital. And one of the things is, oh, digital invoicing, uh, paperless trade, electronic identities. What does that, that all mean? Does that mean that there's some, you know, do we all change the way we do things? Does Indonesia have to change the way it does things? Or does New Zealand have to change the way it does things to comply with that particular agreement? Or, you know, how, how do we bring that story to life? How do we explain deeper to your audience rather than saying, oh, so-and-so signed deeper, win, you know? That's a great, you know, good MOU. So 
Um, that'll be a good one, I think, to be looking at. Um, the other, the, uh, one other thing I like to do is I like to know what trade lawyers do. So Deb Elms, who's coming on the scene later, is somebody you want to stalk regularly because she's what we call a trade lawyer. So they go around um, helping people work out things like RCEP. I mean, what does that even mean, helping people with RCEP? Do you go to a business person's premises and go, oh, you just roll out this rim of documents and go, oh, let's look at chapter three, and then we'll, we'll make that happen for your, you know, I don't know, shoe manufacturing. Uh, we'll look at chapter five. But what are, what are the practicalities of chapter four and chapter five for those people? How do they actually use RCEP, for example, to their advantage? And maybe you can work with a trade lawyer. I mean, it all sounds like a bit of documentary, but it is documentary that we want to bring trade to life with. So, you know, if you, if you stalk so Deb Elms, you follow her for a day, and then you, you see how she, you know, rolls out RCEP and how it helps everyday traders, exporters, importers, you might be, you know, the average reader could understand deeper. Uh, sorry, beg pardon, uh, a trade lawyer's work a little bit better. And these are the things that happen behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about. So I think that's one of the things that I would like to do. Um, things that I like to do less of are explainers. I, 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 I know it gets the clicks and people like to know, oh, okay, uh, uh, what's in the China-US trade war? Oh, okay, what's happening to sanction? What does that mean for my business? Sure, I think that's all very important, but I wonder, and this might be controversial, is whether AI can help with that. I don't know how many of you actually use AI in your newsrooms. I don't, I think it takes a lot of you, um, you know, copywriting and marketing and journalism work out of our daily lives. But that in itself might be a good thing, because if you take out the bread and butter and the things that a machine can do, potentially, you can save a lot of time. Because going through a story, like an explainer, it, it takes quite a bit of time for the workflow to happen. Yeah. It's not like you can just put out a story and it's like an explainer, it doesn't go to the rigor of editing and all that. It still goes through the two or three hours of processing. Mm -hmm. So that takes up a lot of your time. So uh, I feel like that we could do less of. And I know that everyone looks at US China because it's the biggest thing in trade, but I'd really like to do less of US and, and China. I like to do more of Southeast Asia. I like to do more of Bangladesh and Pakistan, for example. I like to know what hap what's happening in the Bengal Bay. I like to know what's going on, you know, uh, in the Rakhine State. I know that there's a, there's, a, there's a war there, there's a lot of atrocities there, but, you know, there's also a lot of trade in silica sands, for example, there. You know, I like to do more of the things that maybe other, everyone's covering, but no one's not covering. So, um, yeah, so those are my, that's my wish list. And then, um, I'll give you an example of something I did do that I'm glad I had a go at it. It's the lobster gray trade on the border of Hong Kong and China. So I was covering China and Australia a fair amount in you know, between 2020 and 2021. And so one of the things that were blocked, you know, from China, the trade off is the lobster trade. So uh, I did actually try to get up to the border of Shenzhen, even though it was during the uh, COVID was very difficult to get around to the borders to get see where the trucks and the boats are actually unloading secret uh, illegal lobsters and there were actually some of them and along with those lobsters they were also you know importing or taking over the border illegal shoes contraband and everything else so we actually did do a little bit of a stakeout on that and then you know try to figure out how they actually get you know some live creatures across the border so that was an interesting story. It took about a couple of months, but I know we, we did it at the post. And this is uh, a couple of years ago and now, I think. So it's been a while since I've done all of these colorful stories. So hopefully um, you guys will have more ideas you want to throw around and discuss. That's that. Okay, um, before we start our uh, exercise, I'd like to open it up to questions, comments. Hello, Salamat Paki. I'm Komail, a journalist Hi. based in South Korea. Uh, about the suggestion of the journey of the shoe, I think, uh, first of all, I wanted to, it's my opinion that we should, it's very interesting to follow till the ship comes and then how it ends up. I think this is 
a part of uh, journalism that we usually miss, but how it ends up and how it dies <laughs> is very important nowadays, and I think it should be, we should be responsible for that part of the journey as well, not just till shops, what I mean. And uh, uh, I want to know your insights, and also uh, you mentioned about the this bulletproof journalism mm -hmm. and fact-checking, uh, which is very essential. But uh, nowadays, I studied journalism like 15 years ago, which was a different time. Now I feel that journalism is more respond to social media and all the mobile phone, I don't know, pretend to be journalism and just sending different, like, comments, and I feel that nowadays uh, journalism, we as journal, professional journal, uh, journalists also uh, kind of trying to make the title in a way that it will be more shared, or just follow up with whatever is going on in social media and we add something to it. And it's uh, really, maybe if we go really like the way that we should go, it won't go to the cycle and then it won't affect that much. So I think we are in a situation that um, whether we need to go to this shallow um, sea of the, this type of journalism or go to fact-checking deep journalists but without audience. I want to know your insights about that. Okay. I'm still question, thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gumi. I think that's a very important uh, uh, remarks uh, and uh, you know having this opportunity to uh, to be in these two roles as a, as an editor uh, for like, more than 15 years and in the last uh, three years being in a management role I I can uh, say with confidence that those in-depth uh, fact checking stories are still very much needed in the market. Not, maybe the audience is smaller uh, than if you compare uh, one long form story with you know, straight news on you know, the arrest or the, the interrogation of our coordinating minister for economic two days ago. Uh, 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 several stories on those uh, process, those interrogation uh, in the Attorney General Office can get, uh, easily can get a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, 100,000 clicks, but for like a long form for the, for the LNG story, for instance, if you get 15, 10, 15,000 viewers, that's already a good, a good achievement. But in the market, if you look at um, how you know uh, the the market perceive your story? Market, uh, what I meant by market is uh, the the particular uh, industries working on that sector. They they are using this story as a as a signal, as as a, as a as an intelligent source to know what really happened in the market. And if you can show that you are independent, you do your story like you know very impartial, you verify and confirm every fact. Uh, it, 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 it emphasizes the relevance of journalism for the market, for, for, for business, for trade, because that's exactly what the market needs. Of course, they can uh, subscribe to uh, other intelligence sources in the market, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of providers for that kind of info. But if it's out there in the public, it carried a certain weight because you are able to publish it publicly to, to, for everyone to see and read. I think that, uh, that in the long term, it, 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 uh, it, it has impact. And for your publication, uh, I can also testify to that, it also grow your brand it will make advertisers uh, look up to you and you know uh, want to place uh, ads, want to work with, with your publication. Because if you have that kind of stories uh, uh, on display, uh, it shows your you know uh, 
your league in, in the market, of course. So I, I will not uh, 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 make it a, a, a adversarial or make it a conflict thing. There, there is stories that uh, need to be uh, uh, produced for the masses, for the social media. We need the audience uh, size. Uh, for certain uh, purposes, but we also need this kind of stories. We need. We also need the in-depth stories. You can. You, you have to be in both uh, formats. I I will respond really quickly mm -hmm. to you and then to the question about shoes. Is which is the chicken and which is the egg? Mm. Do our audiences reading this clickbait social media stuff because we give them social media stuff? Or maybe we don't give them the social media stuff and we give them the long form journalism, the real stuff. And so part of my problem with doing a pair of shoes story is the two challenges is my editors, they're a, they're a big block. You know, they're a barrier. I'll be honest about that straight up. Mm. A and B, <laughs> access. It's really hard to say, go into a factory and say, hey, can you let me go on this journey on with a pair of shoes? So it. it I don't know how to answer that question. I hope you have some ideas about how to combat this continuous feeding of sorry, social media nonsense. I mean, in a way, we have to follow some of these conversations, but mm. how much of it is us telling them what to read? I mean, we have a social response. We have a public interest responsibility to tell people what really is the, you know, the story to read, yeah. not what they think they want to read. Sure, it's easy to scroll around these social media stories because it's easy. Mm. But isn't that like a shortcut, lazy way of doing journalism? In fact, it's not even journalism. It's just, as you say, it was repackaging, mm. you know, Twitter feeds into something else. I don't know what that is. So maybe, maybe journalism has reached a point where it's actually not, you know, um, healthy anymore. Yeah. And it needs all of us to then make a stand and try and change that. Whether or not that's speaking up collectively to your editors, or maybe it's involving people like the National Press Foundation to speak on our behalf to help with their education. It's really hard to tell. I know people have business models and I know that, and they have to, to chase certain things. But again, maybe it's about using artificial intelligence, doing all that stuff that they want, and then keeping the real people to do the real shoe stories. Mm. So, mm. I mean, that's really, yeah, that's what I think anyway. So, sorry, there were questions. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Lisa from the Wall Street Journal. I guess I'm curious, you know, can you recommend for, for folks in the room, what are the best public databases to go to if you want to do more in-depth trade reporting? And if you could, you know, walk us through the genesis of a data-driven story, when you have a data set, what are the red flags you tend to look out for? Mm -hmm. And how does that result in a story? Thanks. I'm looking at okay, I'll, I'll, uh, the, the first database that uh, comes to my mind uh, is Comtrade uh, for, from UN. Yeah. Uh, that's that's uh, a very useful as a, as a starting point uh, because you can always compare uh, the export import from you know uh, different countries. But the red flag is you all you have to uh, then go to the original source. So once you get some idea uh, of uh, the story that you know you want to do based on the country data then you go to the original source on uh, the countries itself the, usually the statistical agency will have the same data because they are the one who input it to the UN website in the first place or the custom office uh, Another red flag is always look at the period of the database and look at the methodology, how they gather the data there. Uh, so you will be aware of the potential bias uh, when the database was formulated or was uh, completed. Uh, and uh, of course, obviously once you have the story based on the data, then you need to go to the field, get some random check on several items or several instances in the data to make sure that it is verified by yourself. So you don't rely entirely on the database itself. There's a funny incident in Indonesia a few months ago. The, one of the presidential candidates in Indonesia quote a story that was done by a local publication that was used uh, uh, data-driven uh, methods. It's about the length of roads uh, 
built by Yudhoyono, the previous administration, and Joko Widodo, the current administration. And the data, the, the story said that the Yudhoyono built way longer roads than Jokowi. And that's, of course, a big blow to the current administration because they always, you know, uh, proud of themselves of building very, you know, uh, in large infrastructure project. And it is then found out that the reason was not because of it actually built more by Udo, you know, but there is a change in terms of, you know, uh, in Indonesia you have provincial road, you have district roads and national roads. So they changed the terms for that particular, that, that three different categories and, and it shows that, you know, uh, you don't know build more roads, but the reality is not that you know black and white. So it shows you know how you have to be very careful when using data. Yeah. Any other databases? Uh, in Indonesia, use the the uh, statistic agency, the BPS data. It's always it's always a good start. And several ministries have very good database. The finance, the finance ministry, uh, the in, uh, the energy and mineral ministries have a good database. Um, the health and education uh, both also have very good databases. The but sometimes in Indonesia, uh, not all websites provide uh, instant access. You, sometimes you need um, <coughs> local ID. Uh, and the uh, and, uh, uh, administrative uh, directorate general, if you want to see uh, beneficial owners or just uh, letter of deeds of companies, you can do that online, but you need ID card, Indonesian ID card. Hi, uh, I'm Shush. Sorry, I'll just add a few more databases, sorry. <laughs> um, there is, um, the, so the Comtrade one is the UN one. Mm -hmm. uh, IMF data, the IMF data portal is yeah. a separate one as well. You can use that one, that one's a good one. Uh, I use IM, that portal and the data rep mapper from, uh, from IMF. And then there is, World Bank has its own portal as well, the data.worldbank.org, use that one. Uh, bearing in mind that some of the data is lagged, so it's not, it's like a couple of quarters old. Mm -hmm. um, WTO has stats um, that goes deeper beyond their reports. So it's stats.wto.org, you can use that one. Um, and if you want China data, I think some of you may already use them, but CEIC data and wind obviously are useful. So you already do that. Um, I also use the IEA, the International Energy Agency. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of data on energy stuff, so please use them. I find them generally quite reliable um, if you want to use that. Even the simplest piece of data is actually a story. So um, yeah. uh, what else have I got here? I've got, yeah, I think that's that for now. And of course, the statistical, as he, um, what you said, mm. each stats department in each country has you know, lots of data. But bearing in mind, if you're doing, say, I don't know, Indonesia to Singapore, the two sets of data may not actually match because it depends on the classification. Yeah. So you have to make it clear how you use the data, yeah. on which side you're actually seek, you know, on which perspective you're actually using. And you should really, if you want the story to be complete, you should mention the other side as well when you're doing a data story. So Singapore stats might have slightly different numbers. So you, I've noticed that you know you, they might say a billion and the other one says 900 million. Mm, there's a slight difference. It's a classification issue yeah. or timing issue. So yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm Shushanta Sinha. I'm from Bangladesh, television reporter. I work for television and I love to use the statistics. Uh, you told that the public interest, you have to mention in the first that we care the public interest. Mm -hmm. As a student of journalism, I think every journalist, if they do some story, it goes to the public interest. Without public interest, there is nothing. So nowadays, we are hearing that public interest journalism, mobile journalism, data journalism, this type of many things are going on. But I think the journalism is journalism. If I do some story, it creates some uh, public interest and also the policy maker, they can change their policy. Like one issue I should uh, mention here, last 2018-19, uh, uh, Bangladesh Bank, our central bank, give the data that we have uh, earned the export earning $37.5 billion. Mm. In 2020, they made the same data that Bangladesh earned in that particular year, that is $37.5 billion. Mm. But in 2021, they published that data, the change, it goes down 
uh, 33.5 billion dollar. Okay. Almost 2 billion dollar is gone. <laughs> Nobody knows. Oh. Everybody knows. And when I made the story, that time Bangladesh Bank said, we are working on it. Ah. You can imagine this is the money that not goes to the freight cost. This is the export receipt by Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So that money, how you changed after two years, financial data. Mm -hmm. So when I made this story, it creates some problem also because Bangladesh Bank, uh, now we are, uh, last year I made that story and we are facing the severely in the foreign currency reserve. That's why the $2 billion is too much because Bangladesh is going to IMF for $4.5 billion. It's almost to half of that money goes on. And another issue I should pick, that is the issue of public interest. Public are involved, but they don't have the interest. Like the cigarette smoker, <laughs> Bangladesh is highest um, okay. a smoking country in the uh, world. That is every day, 20 crore Bangladeshi taka, that's mean 20 million Bangladeshi taka, they are taking money, uh, they are taking from the people out of the price that printed in the cigarette packet. Mm -hmm. Each stick, they are taking one taka more. Mm -hmm. So in, if you calculate daily 20 crore, means in a uh, year, they are taking 7,000 crore taka. Mm -hmm. That's mean if you equal, equal to 100 taka in dollar and Bangladeshi currency, mm -hmm. so it goes to billion of dollars mm -hmm. they are taking from the people, but nobody bothers. But I made that story, and that time the NBI National Board of Revenue, they take the action, they took the action, and they changed the policy that every product should be mentioned in the name, uh, price tag in the packet, and they should sell beyond this, not excess the pricing. So why I'm telling those two stories made by me, because of this public is involved, but they don't bother, everyone smoking but they are paying the much more money. But that educated people, when go to the outside of the rickshaw puller, if he charge some um, extra money, then he is quarreling with him or her. Yeah, yeah. So that is the issue. I think the journalism is the <coughs> main issue apart from this other phenomenon. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Everybody knows and nobody knows. Everybody knows, nobody knows. <laughs> Public involved, but not interested. Very good quotes. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I, I know your question will trigger a lot of discussion. Uh, this is part of that, I think, long debate that happened in our profession. And I think it takes, it will need a lot more uh, contribution and effort from all of us to make sure that the industry, the, the, the press, the, the news media industry, you know, move to the right direction because there is now, there's a lot of other forces that try to redefine journalism and I think it's very important. I think that's why there is the term public interest journalism becomes you know more and more cited in recent time because we need to emphasize that the real journalism is the public interest journalism. The other form of publishing story sometimes not really journalism and we need to say it up front. Uh, that's not journalism. And um, I totally agree with you. Sometimes uh, the public is not in, not not really interested. But I would say that sometimes uh, it doesn't. You, you need to see audience or public in in a more broader terms, and it has segments. So even though the general public might not read or click your stories, but if you can get the authorities, you can get the decision makers, you can get the members of parliament to care about the story and they can do something after reading your story. I think that's also worth it. I wonder if I could brainstorm your story for a second. Yeah. How, how did you, when you looked at the numbers and you saw the discrepancies, yeah. what was your starting point? Did you have an act, a, a, a contact inside mm. government that was able to give you more information about how that number, that the dollars were being you know, um, taken from the people? What was your starting point on that? that? Pricing, yes, you? yes. So yeah, we can brainstorm this. We might as well make this a, a practical session, otherwise it's just all theory. So mm -hmm. yeah, go on. Uh, beside my journalistic job, I do some research on tobacco control and public health issues. That's why last 10 years I'm doing so. Uh, when I go to the research, that time the trader, the small 
shopkeepers and traders, they are saying that we are taking money from the people extra beyond the package, what the pricing is printed and pricing is fixed by the government. Only cigarette product in Bangladesh, government, National Board of Revenue, they fix the price. Mm. With tax, all kinds of taxes, this is high tax. Right. But it you know, a uh, decision made by the government. So packaging, print, uh, what the number of uh, price is printed in package, mm. that is the issue of the government. Because they calculate the tax. All right. So you, you, if, you notice that people would, the shop sellers, the, yeah. se the sellers are actually taking 20, say 20, un $20 say, yeah. and taking an extra dollar. Yeah. And, and no one's checking the, the labeling yeah. on the, okay. And then what happened? Because then they said, I told him why you are taking extra money. Then he give me, show me the money receipt for the dealer or agent of cigarette company. Mm. He brought the price which was printed in the uh, last price, almost 270 taka per 10 tick cigarette or 20 tick cigarette. Okay, the price that should be sell by the local trader. But traders are purchasing that cigarette on the fixed price of the company which is printed. So the company was actually the telling company them is actually what liable right. because they have give some the um, uh, discount for that uh, uh, wholesale, wholesaler to retail seller. Right, right, right. But they don't do that. That's why they are selling the <coughs> cigarette with the uh, package what the printed price. Yes. Plus and more. traders need to profit to charge the extra money. All right. So it was it came from the wholesale. Wholesale. The, the distributor the, yeah. actually said, "Pick up two extra dollars, for yeah. example, on it." Yeah. And then and they did, and yeah. then the money went to the wholesaler. Yeah. And then so following through the money. Uh, wholesaler is the appointed by the cigarette yeah. companies okay. because you don't want a right to purchase cigarette to making business right. because they have the supply chain. Yes. So producer, cigarette company, they have the agent, they have the distributor, they have the wholesaler, yep. Yep. then goes to the retailer. Yep. So there is a uh, commission, trade commission, trade margin through agent, through dealer, through retailer. Yes. But they don't give the trade commission to uh, traders or agents. That's why the end of the day, consumer are paying much more money. Yes. It goes to cigarette companies. There is a huge amount of taxes because one taka in Bangladeshi, if you uh, price in cigarette, there is 81% taxes. So 7,000 crore taka in annual, you are taking from people. So there is 5,000 crore taka almost in the taxes. Mm -hmm. All so they're, re tax. they're recovering the taxes from the people? Yeah, to but pay they to don't the government. pay the government. They don't pay so to two issues is there. Oh, they don't pay to the government? Yeah. This is, they don't, they don't charge the extra money because the fixed amount is uh, settled by the NBR. Mm -hmm. That is the issue. Right. There are two kinds of funds. One is taking extra money and they don't pay the taxes of the extra money. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So it's actually monies that were sitting as profits slushing around in the the, the secret maker, yeah, the, cigarette, the, the company itself. Yeah, but they don't show the, their uh, annual report in that uh, extra money. How did you find that number then when because you were looking at this an annual state? Th yeah. The statements would be there yeah. and the numbers would be blended into yeah. Sections. Yeah. How did you find that number? Uh, I started in 10 years annual report of British American Tobacco Company. They are the largest one. Mm. They, uh, their market share is almost 67% in Bangladeshi mm. cigarette market. So last 10 years I analyzed their data and there is a huge discrepancy mm. because they don't have right to uh, inject the extra money in their books of <coughs> accounts because this is illegal. They have the authority of uh, British American tobacco in internet, global practice. Mm. So they are taking money, they are, uh, cannot in, uh, inject the money in their financial accounts. Right. So this is fully illegal. Yeah, but how did you, f did you find it? Yeah. How, you, you analyzed 10 years yeah. of their financial statements. Yeah. yeah. And what gave away the missing dollars? How did you actually find that, through looking at 10 years, how did you find the missing numbers through doing that? Uh, this is very easy because they have to say each month 
how many cigarettes they are uh, selling, selling. Oh. and they have to take the permission from the national board of the revenue because there is a tax levy or tax stamp you have to put in the every cigarette packet so you are claiming that this type of uh, this month july yeah. they will produce 1 lakh packet right. so they will go to the nbr and apply for 1 lakh packet cigarette stamps mm -hmm. and it will come from the our security printing press and then you will go to the market so there is a chain of supply side also and also the uh, revenue collection side right so the actual revenue collection for that volume of cigarettes doesn't match the numbers that are actually in Important. the statements they, so, for example, if they were supposed to produce X volume and it was supposed to be X dollars, it's not the number that you're seeing in the statements. Is that correct? Yeah. And every year for 10 years is the same? Yeah, same. Almost same. And another issue that is that we have separating the data discrepancy. That is, in our national budget, on the 1st of uh, uh, July or uh, June, we proposed the budget. Okay? In the mid of the year, government uh, rethink that we will not be able to um, collect the revenue that we fixed in the earlier, and we will not expend the money as we uh, shortage of revenue collection. Then in the middle of the year, they change the budgetary amount. We call the... Uh, <laughs> it's like a rejig in the budget. Mid -year. Amended budget. Yeah. Okay? And the lastly, in the June of next year, 30 June of the next year, we came to the another data. They came to the another data with the actual budget. <laughs> so there is a three data. First, proposed budget, and this amendment budget, and mm -hmm. third is the actual budget. And similar problem with the cigarette industry, British American Tobacco Company, Japan Tobacco, they have their financial accounts on the Ju January to December, calendar year. Yes. But in Bangladesh, government or NBR or other institution, we calculate the financial year. That start from the 1st July to June. 30 June. Yeah. So when I calculate to the particular year with British American Tobacco and the government uh, revenue, there is a difference because mm -hmm. they don't calculate the financial year like the government. Yeah. So there is a problem. Similarly, when I go to the Indian and Bangladesh trade relationship, there is a discrepancy. And the same thing, we can't find these things. That is the Indian financial uh, year start from April. Mm. But our financial year start from July. So how long did it take for you to go through the 10 years? And how did you get time off? I'm asking you a question now. How, and how did you get time off from your you know, daily grind to do that story? I mean, what was the, how do you get there? Almost 11 months. It's a one-year yeah, investigation. One, almost 11 months. I was fully concentrated to check the BAT's financial report and know BAT is a multinational company. They have so many uh, influence in our policy making issues and also BAT has their board. Most uh, influential secretariat in Bangladesh, they are sitting in the BAT board. And it was very uh, crucial for me to check again and again that why you are checking the fact checking issues because if there is a single data mismatch they will sue me of course so it takes 11 months and finally i uh, published this data and and the editors were okay for you to spend 11 months yeah. on this project yeah how did you get them to say yes sorry how did you get them to say yes to allow you to spend 11 months on that I project they wanted it or you wanted it or how did yeah, it work? This is two issue. I, uh, it was my research project mm. and my office gave me that time and I did some other work with this uh, ah. program. Right. So this is another issue that... We oh, I finally published this news in not only in Bangladesh and also the other uh, media also. Yeah. So Th there is another issue that, that we you should discuss. How do we then pitch this kind of story to the newsroom, to the editors? Maybe others have some difficulties, want to share their tips maybe? How do you convince your editors to do passion, passion, your, pa your passion project, your passion story? Because obviously your editor trusts you enough yeah. to give you that. In Tempo, my experience as an editor-in-chief, I ask every reporter to have their own passion project. 
So that make it easier for this kind of ideas to surface because it needs the right environment in the newsroom to make sure that you are not only confined to your assignment or your bit uh, to do your daily stories. Maybe anyone wants to share also their own? Somebody over there has a passion project, I think. I think there's three or four of them. Hi, I'm Chapek from Channel News Asia. So with TV, um, we pretty much 24-7. Yeah. But of course, you know, as with every newsroom around the world, we have hate count issues. Yeah. Uh, young people, they are drawn to TV. They want to appear on TV. Not everybody can be on TV. <laughs> Newsflash. Um, plus, we have bulletins to run, right? So to kind of take the pressure off, sometimes, uh, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, we, we do have to repeat a lot of content mm. because there is that much we can do with ex existing and there's the bread and butter, right? Like today, you know, that kind of thing, mm. you know. Um, so I am a bit on, I do do my own stories and I, at one point in time, I was assigning stories and just to give, okay, uh, to be concise, you're a journalist, right? Um, what we did for our bureaus, uh, the international bureaus especially, because they are very thinly staffed. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. Whole of China, two correspondents. Wow. Is that enough? Obviously mm -hmm. not, mm. right? Uh, any one day, just in Beijing alone, maybe you have 10 correspondents and you still can't do enough stories. Mm -hmm. So, and for TV output, right, our credibility is like, oh, when Tingang, something like this happens, oh, let's go to our correspondent in Beijing, what does she have to say? So this is obviously is a more important story, she'll make herself available. But what our uh, EIC has decided was, you know, only on significant events, we tap our correspondents. Yeah. Because they need to have their free reign to run uh, stories and you know, also passion projects and also we have uh, 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 it's kind of a weekly bulletin so to speak, half an hour, mm. correspondence uh, diary, so it's through the region and a bit longer form, say five, seven minutes, more of a package and you know, they, they go and do their the property crisis, you know, someone Cannot mm. uh, they have to live in a ro rotting apartment with no mm. sewage, no lighting, mm. Mm. you know, the kind, of, the kind of stories that, of course, yes, you get a lot of clicks and you get awards as well. So everybody is kind of happy. And, you, you know, we also recently have a, a report that, um, surprising even to, to, to ourselves, that, you know, you think Channel News Asia Singapore uh, national broadcaster, most of our audience is, of course, Singaporeans. And then um, we do get a lot of traction from within the region, uh, like say during Myanmar, what happened, a lot, we got a lot of traffic mm. coming to us, to our sites. Our, uh, and then uh, actually, but we are getting a lot of data where we find that um, North American audiences actually want long form content mm. out of East Asia and Southeast Asia. So, you know, in this way, we kind of free up the correspondence as much as we can. Like, you know, if we cannot get them to come in, get a guest, yeah. for example, you know. So this, this is some one kind of quick and dirty way, you know, that you can, you, you just have to kind of think of other ways, you know, to let your correspondents who are on the ground, they have the very wide contact base, uh, obviously the language skills yeah. to pursue all these stories that people really want to watch and learn about. So that's my two cents worth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It comes both ways, from the top and also from the bottom. I'm Anton with the Southeast Asia Globe in Cambodia. I guess to answer your question briefly, the only way that we get these longer term projects funded or approved by our editors is through funding. <laughs> so I think for independent newsrooms across the region, it's, it's grants like what the National Press Foundation would supply. And we've definitely spoken about this. Um, so the two main concerns with that is one, of course, it's unsustainable. So the second you stop getting these grants or a reporter stops applying, because this usually happens after hours, hmm. all the money for these field trips, you know, to go out in Cambodia to follow these mango farms, no editor is going to approve that. So I wanted to ask you, I guess, how you see sustaining that for smaller newsrooms. Um, I know Tempo has also received a lot of these reporting grants. And then I guess my second question is, uh, what role does collaborations have in these, you know, wish list projects? Do you try to find a collaborator for everyone, or to be honest, does that slow down the whole process and it's better to just do it uh, internally? I think that's something a lot of 
independent newsrooms, especially in the Mekong, are struggling with um, because these data sets from the government just aren't available. So a lot of it requires, you know, days in the field and all the money for that. Um, so I was curious about how you, th you thought about sustaining that in the future and whether or not collaborations really is like the long-term solution for, for smaller newsrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean grants. Can you talk about grants? Uh, I yeah, I think that's one of uh, very useful tips to get your passion project going. Get how, a grant. How much grants are there in the world there's for this sort of thing? What? Uh, well, it's not enough, obviously. But if you look, uh, there is the, the, uh, a page on LinkedIn for the, what is it called? The Global Fund for Media Development, something yep. like that, and also the Public Interest Fund. Uh, there are multiple newsletters that, that journalists run that go straight into your inbox yeah. for these grants. And then there are groups like NPF, the Pulitzer Center, um, Earth Journalism Network. The only yeah. issue that comes up is that a lot of these grants are government funded. So USAID, mm -hmm. AusAid, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. Yeah. So a lot of these groups that are paying, that will actually get you into the field, they don't have editorial control, but it is coming from, from different, usually Western yeah. governments to cover this. Um, but there are, in terms of how many grants are there for environmental stories? I would say wow. we probably apply to one or two grants a month yeah. um, to cover a lot of our, our region. Yeah, so, and so it's so. rotating basis, so it's not just one term. You can apply, if you miss the deadline this month, you can apply next month. And most are annual mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I just want to mention maybe two initiatives that are also happening now. Uh, the Global Fund for Public Interest Media is also uh, gathering a lot of uh, fund. Uh, they, I think they, they uh, they want to get a one billion for USD for I think they in the process of getting that and once it there it can be more sustainable source of reporting grants and the other part that also ongoing is the negotiation between publishers and platform happen in Australia for the Bergening Code in Canada I think once that happened in each of our countries that will be also another source of uh, fun for doing uh, public interest journalism because it's compensate for the news the platform use. What about ICIJ? Do people still go to ICIJ for funds or grants? Um, they don't give out funds for uh, reporting. They, oh. if there is, usually every year they will have uh, leaks that, you know, uh, big enough to be shared among uh, you know, more than a dozen countries, then they will invite newsrooms to participate. But there is no grants with uh, with the collaboration. Right. So even if you get those grants, though, the question is how to get, free up your time to actually yes do the work. So yeah. you still have to actually do get away from the newsroom, mm -hmm. and 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 you know to your point about you, you're lucky that your correspondents are given time off. Mm. I don't get that a time off. You know. So you know if you're running on a very lean model, then yeah. you, correspondents do everything. So I, I wonder if other newsrooms have adopted that stance where they free people up For to projects. do Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you do, you, you do it at Temple, right? Um, we are a weekly magazine. So right. the, oh, the yes. business model is a bit different. It's subscriber base. Uh, it's, it's different if you are impression based. If you're looking for like the reach and then your advertising comes, depends on the wider reach you can get. I can understand the pressure to get like more uh, audience so stories. So it, it comes down to business models in the end. So it also comes down then to, to which business model you like to subscribe to. So if you're going for the CNAs and the Straits Times and the South China Morning Post, that's a business model, unfortunately, based on a lot of clicks, mm. right? So, but if you go on a magazine business model, and maybe this is something you want to think about, that maybe the daily grind is not for you because if you want to do long form, you might have to join something like Tempo because that's a magazine model and mm. there or for example like the economist mm. or national geographic where their entire model is based on just doing long form or any other of the, the similar you know mm. um, uh, ilk but if you don't everything else is going to be quite difficult i think unless and someone's got an idea how they actually persuaded their editors to actually change their mind about their newsrooms but i don't know maybe someone's got an idea oh so you've got an idea Hi, uh, Dylan here from uh, Nikkei Asia. Uh, so um, I guess uh, for us, I think whether it's, uh, it, it's I, I would say we are probably on a hybrid. So we have the long form stuff and we have the daily grind. Yeah. Um, and we don't chase the, the viral stuff. So that hurts us in the sense that we don't get as many views because we don't 
really do the clickbaity stuff mm-hmm. uh, that's on social media. That's a very conscious effort on our part to try to deliver at least content that is um, that feeds your mind. Uh, so um, I guess this is what I learned from uh, the Financial Times because um, Nikkei owns FT and mm. we had a few sharing sessions with them. In the example of stories like uh, Wirecard, uh, what happened is that I think the fundamental basis is that if you find something that uh, you have investigated and it is a big enough story, the first step would probably be to convince your editors that it is a big enough story. Mm. So once you cross that hurdle and they are convinced that this is um, something that is worth time that's devoted for, the model that they might do is to set up a special projects. So you wrangle one editor or one head editor to hit this story uh, that's working in the background then you lasso one or two or three other reporters to work on this story and you create a special room uh, where you brainstorm and you develop your sources, you cultivate your sources for the story uh, and where all that secret information goes to as you develop the story. Meanwhile, you go about your daily job mm-hmm. uh, and uh, when there are things to cover and uh, uh, um, stories, uh, sports stories to write about, you do that but there's always an overriding emphasis on, at the end of the day, taking your time to perhaps deliver this big impactful story uh, that might make the headlines or might win awards. Uh, And so uh, the model that perhaps we would do is to create a special projects team of one, two editors, a few reporters, because sometimes stories, it's, it's hard for one person to have all the sources. So you get people across the region if you have different offices or bureaus uh, in the region to develop and tap their sources to pull together a story that um, you splash at the end of the day when every, you have all the information collated, verified <coughs> and especially uh, go through your legal team as well mm. uh, to make sure that you know, everything is good so that uh, um, um, in the event of lawsuits you are able to protect yourself with the information that you can use in the courts or whatever case may be, uh, as it may come to. So at least, you know, um, um, uh, I guess to sum it up, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, there's a, for us it's both a hybrid uh, in terms of the long form future content and we also have to do the, the spot thing to keep the content refreshed on the website so that, mm. you know, people don't see old news. I don't know whether that answers anything, but that's just from my perspective. Yeah. On iFridge, how long is the spatial pro- team work? Uh, as long as you need to get the story done. Yeah. So there's no... Uh, I, I don't suppose that they set a deadline. We only give you three months to work on this story. Sometimes uh, I've heard certain FT editors or FT writers say that they set on a story for one or two years because they couldn't crack it. Uh, and that wow. goes on uh, for as long as it takes to get the necessary information and to develop the sources out. So there isn't a hard deadline on... Um, of course, there's always the conscious uh, 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 mindset that you know, someone may get the story. You know, so, mm-hmm. of course, you want to try to be expedient about it. But um, as, as long as you continually work at it in the background, uh, and you work at it as long as you need to, take a, uh, to crack the story. So it, it, this, I don't think they set a hard three months, four months, six months. We get this project out and we're done with, we move on to the next thing. Mm. Yeah, so it's, this is kind of like an ad hoc look at, you know, uh, if a certain issue or a topic comes along that is worth investigating and putting time into, then you create a special team to do it. Yeah. Yeah, you've had a good model. But the FT, obviously, and Nikkei have that as a, as a cultural mandate, so they all agree they have to give... So they have a KPI, do they? It's on, not a KPI. It's not a KPI? It's not a KPI. So it is as and when a story like that comes along, then you create that special projects uh, for that story uh, to just see through. Yeah, yeah. Because often without KPIs, <laughs> no one's going to do it. <laughs> You've got to stick it into your performance reviews to say, hey, editor A, we want to see a passion project out of you every, I don't know, six months, whether it lasts a year or not, you have to come up with something. But editors don't have that KPI. That's why I wonder, how do they get the FT and Nikkei guys to be so passionate to say, hey, let's do a spotlight room for this story. Mm. I, I don't I know there, any editors. So there's no KPI no, for, for this. So there isn't a, you have to deliver two scoops a year, things right, like right, that. Right. Uh, at least that I'm conscious of. Um, but the, the, the whole idea is to 
look for these stories. Uh, I, I guess as part of your natural instinct as a journalist, and once you see something like this, you alert your editor, and uh, they will assess if it is um, of merit to be able to create a special projects team or a special projects squad to be able to tackle this, and then they'll do it. Mm -hmm. But they don't give us like hard. Every three months, you have to deliver a story like Wirecard or things yeah. like that. Yeah. You did not get any bonus or anything like. There's something that sort of have motivated you okay. to do it. <laughs> you had a bonus. Wow. Yeah. So uh, um, I mean. <laughs> So, <laughs> I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, do have a, we do have a bonus structure, definitely. But uh, I don't know how it's, honestly, I don't know how it's assessed. Um, uh, I think your question is, uh, what motivates us to uh, look for stories like this? I don't know, because culturally, in the newsroom, there just is a motivation for it. I don't know how to explain it. As, as in, like, it's sure. not like... Um, I guess it's a post, uh, a case of you see your peers doing great stories and you want to do a great story yourself. It's the motivation. So we don't go to the editor and say, I'm hoping to get, you know, a three months bonus out of this school. <laughs> you know, there isn't something like that. Uh, no. It's more a case of, as far as I can see culturally in the newsroom, I look at my colleagues in China, they did this great story. I aspire to do something like this. You know, and same, vice versa. They may see a good story that I do, and they hope to do some, something like this. So I think that's the sort of culture that we are working on. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know whether you think this is highly imaginative, but that's just what I feel is sort of like pushing us to look for things like this. Because we just want to um, uh, 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 do something that's impactful, um, that would, you know, uh, sort of like, um, live up to um, um, the expectations of our audience and also, you know, at least show that, you know, um, what your colleagues over in the Hong Kong Bureau can do or the China Bureau can do, you can also do as well. Yeah. Um, so we're coming up on time, um, but the discussion was so good, I did not want to interrupt with the exercise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through it and you can do it on your own. Um, and I know that there were some other questions out there. I would encourage you, if, if the speakers are okay with staying a bit, to come talk to the speakers as you've been doing. Um, so just very quickly, um, <laughs> so some, some things to think about. Uh, first, rapid radical brainstorming. Um, this is all gonna be ours, so hopefully it'll be easy to remember. Um, so you're all familiar with the idea of blue sky um, that is like, think about, you know, we talked about a lot of obstacles, right? We talked about access, we talked about editors not approving what you want to do. Um, a number of you are in places where press freedom is not mm. the best. Um, pretend none of that exists. Pretend you are your editor's golden child. They say yes to everything you want. Um, <laughs> pretend you have all the access in the world, you know, all the right people. What are the stories you would most want to do? And, and don't, don't evaluate as you go. Just make a list of what's coming into your brain. What is, you know, what's the th things that you most want to tackle? So that's the first part. That's the first part of the brainstorm. Then, refine. So choose a few of those and think about, okay, what, what can I actually build out here? Like what, what, what of these is a little bit more possible? And then hopefully you have, you know, three to five of those that have a little bit more meat to it that you think, okay, there's some, there's some reality here. Actually, I'm gonna make that to ours also. Refine realistic. Okay. And then the last one, ready. So choose at least one and get it ready for a pitch. So mm -hmm. like build it out to the point where, okay, I'm gonna, this is, the, this is the one that I'm gonna take to my editor first, and this is the one that I want to prioritize. Um, so I would encourage you all to do that on your own. Um, uh, we were gonna do it up at the whiteboards and uh, it would have been loud, but it's probably better just that you're, you're, you're loud in your own heads anyway. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I so appreciate you all for coming and for um, facilitating this discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you.